On this finale of the Grandpa's Backyard mini-series, it drove here and parked in this spot in 2003. We're into a few problems along the way. Fix some problems. It's making the right sounds, that means it must work. And then this happens. Here we have another Kenworth bus. Now, my dad picked this up shortly after he got the first one for spare parts, because how often do you find one of these? That was back in 2003. It drove here and parked in this spot in 2003, and has never moved since. Now I need to get this moved, and I don't think I'm towing this one. So we're gonna try to get this thing running and drive it out of here. Now luckily, the engine compartment has been propped open permanently by this very tall tree that has uh, grown up since it has been parked here. So, engine compartment access is easy. There's cables, there's lots of wires, so something's gotta work. Circuit breakers, sure that helps. I see a fuel filter in there. Let's follow the line and see where that goes. Yeah, it goes right here. Um, yeah. Let me take you on a tour of this thing. This was converted to a camper really nicely a long time ago. They had done all wood paneling on the entire thing. Has stonework. There used to be a fireplace here. There's where the chimney went out. Bunks that hinge up and down. A skylight that isn't here anymore, which is a cause of a lot of the problems. A tile inlaid table. We've got the moss growing up nicely in all the grooves. So that's a good habitat at this point. Nice wooden shower area. Bathroom. More nice woodwork, folding bunks, huge bed, all sorts of stuff. Another skylight in the back. Another skylight over the nice tile kitchen. This thing was done really well. It's a shame it was falling apart, but that's the reason my dad got it. It was already falling apart, infested with the animals. It wasn't livable anymore. So it already deteriorated when he got it and he just kept it for parts for the other bus. Sad, but that's what happened. It looks like holes for six by nines. Manual transmission, appears to be a five speed. Does this shift? It's not the smoothest shifting thing in the world, but, oh, we got bricks falling down. It looks nice, but it's not sturdy. The old door handle for when it was a school bus. Here's an air pressure regulator. And uh, one side's completely disconnected. So I'm not sure if that means anything good. It's a Pacific school coach. The serial number is not too far off of that 1953 one. I'd guess this is 51 or 52. I'm gonna call it 52, but somewhere around there. Let's get that engine compartment all the way open. All right, kind of sturdy. No prop rod on this one. Don't see any hornets chasing me yet. We're in good shape. Now I've seen this bus sitting here for a long time, but I never really dug into it. When I worked on the other bus, I opened up the hood a little bit, looked at the radiator, looked at the fan, and looked at the fact the fan blades pulled air from here and went that way. And that's all I did. Now I'm looking at it a little closer, and it's kind of interesting. That's definitely not the original radiator. Looks like that is the original radiator. Because there is the big tunnel where the cooling air comes in. I don't think those electric fans were supposed to be here at all. It looks like you could belt drive a fan from that engine over here and have a mechanical drive fan right there. It's just interesting to see the original radiator. And the radiator filler neck is way out here. Somehow that doesn't look very original. I doubt Kenworth would have put a radiator filler neck that stuck a foot out the back. But that gasket kind of looks original. It might have been flush here. Very odd. For sure the radiator is not original. I don't know if the motor is original or not either. But it's what I got, so we're gonna see if we can get this running. Now, luckily, we have a very effective rain cap here. I believe there's a one quart variety, but there we have a holly. Does anything move? The linkage moves. The linkage goes to open and the spring snapped. All right, well, I like the rope holding the radiator hose out of the fan blade. I admire this upper radiator hose. So here's the thermostat housing. We've got a big diameter hose here. That appears to be a tailpipe adapter going to a smaller size. Then we go to an elbow, 
and then it has the rubber hose clamped directly to threads of a threaded fitting, which goes to a barb fitting, which has a hose clamp connecting... That's plastic, not metal. That's that black, I think it's ABS pipe, that they use for water line. And then that has a piece of rubber hose connected to it with a hose clamp. And then we have a rope going to the engine, holding it that way. We have wire wrapped around a few times, holding it that way. And then we go to the radiator. That is just impressive. That's bone dry. Not 100% sure where the oil dipstick is. I think you put it in somewhere obvious. It's easy to check. Oh, hey, found the dipstick. Uh, that's useful. I don't think I'll be checking the oil with that. There's the air compressor. Now this thing should have air brakes, which means this engine needs to run to run that compressor in order to release the brakes. We've got to get the brakes to release before I even think of moving this thing. Bad enough sunk in as far as it is. I don't even want to think about trying to drag this with the wheels locked up. All right, I'm going to put a bar on this and see if it turns at all. It does turn. Let's see if we can do a complete rotation. Oh, this is good news. I hear the air compressor doing compressing. We may be in good shape here. I mean, relatively. Considering everything else that's going to go wrong shortly. I think I've got a full rotation in it, which means we can crank this thing over. We have hope. I was going to throw a battery in here and I saw these wires. It appears this is our control system. We have one labeled pump, one labeled ignition, and I'm guessing maybe something here starts it? No. Almost looks like it's enough wire to run it up front. Perfect. Only one of those was hooked up. Okay, that's perfect. We got stuff labeled. It says to start. Um, that appears to be labeled for positive ground. This one fell off, used to do something. I think it was a plus. And this is a plus. So everything over here apparently is positive except for that one ground. Uh, looks like this solenoid needs to be grounded because there's a little wire flopping here that says ground. And uh, that doesn't seem like a good ground necessarily. There we go. All right, kind of secure. Oh, hey, there's my starter jumper wire. Perfect. Let's see if any of this works. So far, no. Found a stash of solenoids. That one's labeled NG question mark. So it might be good. Oh, gets warm. Okay. What else we got? That one doesn't have any warning labels on it. I'm sure it works fine. Let's put this one in. I was just about to walk away and I noticed something interesting. I was looking at how to hook this up and there's one terminal, which I figured would trigger the solenoid, but it's labeled I. I thought you were supposed to go to the S terminal, which isn't there. Then I looked over here. Here's another one that looks identical. This only has an S, not an I. So I'm going to bring both with me and see what happens. found this alligator clip in here. I was going to use it to jumper it, but it won't actually open. I just bent the tab. We'll just unhook this and go with bare wire. Got my official solenoid test rig set up. Get nothing on this one. This is the one that only has the I terminal. Here's the one that only has the S terminal. Yep, that's doing stuff. It's making the right sounds, that means it must work. Now it looks like this was mounted to a curved fender once. So let's just reorient it for flat surface mounting. There, that'll work. All grounded, properly connected, let's hook up the cables. Get everything hooked back up. Even added that extra little jumper wire, so I have a jumper wire already attached. This is pretty close to factory at this point. Hmm. Nothing. So we very well might have a bad ground. I found an old wire that has a big ring terminal on one end to go to the battery and then two terminals on the other end. So I got to hook one to each screw on the uh, solenoid mounting. So this is ideal. It's even the right color. So everything's working out according to plan. It's perfect. New ground is in. Now let's see what happens. It clicks. 
and that's it. There we go. A lot more access now. I'm gonna try dumping the solenoid itself because I'm not really sure this actually works. And I've got power to one side of it, the battery side. Let's check the solenoid. Yep, we got power to the other side. Either the starter lead or the starter is the issue at this point. I was hoping not have to find the starter, but let's figure out where that is. It's got to be attached to the engine, so that's something. That's a big old canister oil filter. Ah, there's the starter. That connection looks uh, quite promising. Now to start with, I brought my half inch drive starter adjustment tool. We'll see if maybe the brushes are stuck. Wait, oh that's that's not even that's not even tightened down at all. There's our problem. I find it helps to have electrical connections that are actually attached in order to conduct electricity. There, let's try that. Nope, that was not the problem. I'm not getting anywhere on the starter, so it's coming out. Get the starter working outside the vehicle. Then we'll throw it in, and maybe we'll have a little more luck. There we go. That's a big one. Got the starter out. Now first thing is see if it spins. And it does. Get to the good stuff here. Get our brushes, make sure they're all free. Huh, there's broken stuff inside there. That's not necessarily a good sign. All right, brushes are all moving. This actually looks pretty good inside. I'm kind of surprised. Go the standard test rig. Oh, I think I saw something. There we go. This is not going back in. That concerns me a little bit. I'll soak some oil in it and hopefully it'll free up on the vehicle. Now I've got all these wires near the coil. I'm just gonna ignore all those. We only need the two wires in the coil. One is gonna go to the distributor. Looks like that one. Which means we need power on this one. It goes. There's our power wire. I'm just gonna hot wire this ignition wire straight to the positive terminal. Squirt a little magic fire juice in the carb. I'm running out of this stuff. We'll, we'll see what happens. Absolutely nothing. I'm sure this is a point ignition. They're probably completely corroded. So we're gonna hit that next. It could be worse. Let's see what we can do. I like how the wires run straight through the side of the distributor housing. No terminal at all. That's handy. Got the points out. They're a little worse than I expected. I don't know what engine this has in it, but I got a number for the points. So I could get a replacement set if needed. I'm gonna to try to clean these up. It's funny how life works sometimes. I was sitting there filing these points, trying to get them to work. And a fellow from up the road happened by Asked how it was going. I said, oh, I'm working on these points, trying to get them working. It's like, oh, I got some. So quick run up the road. He had an old set of standard ignition points. Uh, and I say old, they're probably a couple decades old, but brand new in the box. I got new points. So that was a bonus. Got the new points in, hooked up my coil wire, and I put some kind of gap at the points. If you care, you'd measure that. I don't, so I didn't. Throw a little more of the magic juice in here. I see smoke coming out of something. Let's figure out what that is. Negative battery cable is real hot, so that was where the smoke's coming from. So we got to fix that. Hmm. Don't really see any issues with the wiring here. That should be fine. It's a good thing I didn't bother measuring this point gap because. It changes. You can just move the distributor shaft around and get different point gaps. I think I'm gonna try closing them a little bit and see if that helps. I found an old spark plug. I'm gonna hook it to the coil wire. I'm gonna crank it over. You guys check for spark and see if it has any. I 
I saw the spark too. We may be getting somewhere. It's starting to rain pretty good. So I'm gonna throw a little gas in the carb, give it one quick shot, and uh, probably pack it in for a while. Oh yeah, that's got a lot. That should be plenty. I had spark at the coil. I'm making the assumption that it has spark at the plugs. Might be worth checking that. But it probably does. Nothing. I'm gonna try just cleaning up the contacts on this cap and see if that makes a difference. I'm real suspicious of that coil. And I probably got another one lying around, so I'm just gonna swap it out. Well, I found a coil lying around. It's labeled, was in truck, with a question mark after it. So I think that's code for, works perfect. I've got good spark at the coil, but when I go to the spark plug itself, at the cylinder, I don't seem to have any. Now I cleaned up the contacts, I don't see much corrosion. The only thing I can think of is a lot of dust and, and some of it looks a little sparkly. I'm wondering if maybe there's enough residue here, it's shorting out inside the cap, so I'm going to try cleaning that out. I let it dry a bit and it's cleaner. Why don't we give this one a shot? Now my main goal is to move this bus a few hundred feet that way. I've been working on the assumption that since it has air brakes, we need the air compressor on the engine to be running so that it releases the brakes so I can move it up there. But I was talking to my dad last night and he said that when this bus drove in 20 years ago, the brakes barely worked at all. So those aren't necessarily holding that in place. It could just be sunk into the ground. So I'm just gonna give it a gentle little tug and see what happens. This may not be happening. So it did look like the front tire moved just slightly. Now it looks like there is no chance I am towing this thing, so I've got to get this engine running somehow. So let's look where we're at with the ignition system. Now these ignition systems comprise two systems, a primary and a secondary. The primary is the 12 volt stuff. So you have 12 volts coming from your battery, going to the positive lead of the coil, and then the negative side of the coil goes to the distributor, and those points open and close and ground that out. And that is what creates spark out of this coil. And I have that. Now that spark has to go to the secondary system, which starts with the coil with that high voltage and goes right into the center of the distributor cap. And from there, it goes to this center contact and that sends a high voltage to this tab on the rotor. And this rotor spins around. The electricity then goes from this tip to one of these contacts and that goes to the spark plug wires, which goes to the actual spark plugs. So I have spark here. It goes here, gets hidden behind that cap, and doesn't come out here. So somewhere in the system, I'm losing all my spark. The usual culprit is this cap and that rotor. I already cleaned them up. Obviously, that's not doing it. Now the question is, can I replace them? Now I know the other bus originally came with an RD450 gas motor, and this has a plate. It says motor number RD450, then a whole string. So I'm assuming it's a RD450 motor, and that's the serial number of the motor. So I went to look it up. There's a problem. That's a six cylinder. This is most definitely a V8, clearly not an inline six, which is what it says I have. So I can't buy parts for the motor I'm supposed to have because that's not it. I gotta figure out what I have before I can even think about buying parts for it. Let's look for identifying characteristics. I have some head casting numbers. CWC, 
I don't see a name on the valve covers. A few identifying features are this gigantic water pump. The intake manifold looks like it actually connects to the block at just one spot there and one spot here on either bank. You actually see the valley pan full of acorns that cover up the cam. So that intake is actually a small unit rested on top of this. Looks like this is a cooling passage plate in the side of the head. And there's one of those on both sides. Looks like a GM style alternator, but that means absolutely nothing. Not seeing really much in the way of manufacturer's identification here. I don't know what that is. Holly four barrel. And it's been adapted on, so that means absolutely nothing. Even a manufacturer would help me if I even knew who made this thing. I suppose if I do a search of big gas V8, I'm going to come up with a lot of answers that are not this. Weird gas V8? I don't know if that's going to get where we want to want to go. Apparently the correct term was V8 with giant water pump. That led me to a site that had the Super Duty 534 Ford V8, which is exactly what this looks like. But before I spent money, I had to make sure it was really necessary. This is purely for scientific purposes here. Moved it like an inch or so. I see a slight bit of movement in the front tires. That does have more pulling power than the Oshkosh, but not enough yet. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna try to make it a little easier to pull by doing things like cutting down the tree that's right behind it and stuff like that. You got a few trees attached to this thing. Well, yep, that side panel's ripping off. So we moved it some. Maybe I'll make a little ramp behind the tires too. Just dig a little bit so they come out a little easier. I backed it up so I'm going downhill. And to shorten the chain, we're going to try it again. It's not doing it. I decided to pry open my wallet and actually throw some new parts at this because it does not look like I'm going to be towing it easy. Granted, I didn't want to spend a lot of money. So I found on eBay a lot of seven spark plugs, new old stock ones. Apparently, when people have V8s, they look for eight spark plugs. If someone has just seven of them, they'll sell them real cheap. Now the spark plugs were easy because I could use the number that was on there. This is a Ford 534 cubic inch Super Duty V8. Apparently they're super torquey, really slow, use a ton of fuel, and no one makes parts for them anymore. Luckily, the cap and rotor, it's the same as a 390 Ford. So that, you can buy anywhere. And O'Reilly sent me a coupon for five bucks off for both the cap and rotor, cost me $13. So I'm up to about $25 total into this repair. More than I wanted to spend, but it might save a lot of hassle. So let's uh, throw this stuff in. I think I found the problem. We have the new rotor versus the old rotor. Compare the tip length. This one was like an eighth inch shorter than that one. The spark had to jump that extra gap. I have a feeling we may have found the problem. It very well may have been, the end of that has just so eroded off, the spark couldn't jump the gap anymore. We might have spark now. Now that I've jinxed it, let's put it in and find out. All right, that's new. I put this bus in neutral. I wonder if it popped into gear. Well, it feels like it's in neutral. It looks at some point when I was pulling it, the fan blade started making contact with the radiator. And this blade actually got caught underneath the radiator. So uh, we're gonna have to straighten the radiator out. That's totally not sturdy. Let's try this again. Nothing. Now this ignition system has just driving me up a wall. And I keep going back to the distributor shaft is moving around and that point gap keeps changing on me. It seems like that problem is not something that's going to go away on its own. I've got to do something about it. 
but I don't want to spend money on this thing. I had an epiphany last night. I realized that I put a cap and rotor from a 390 Ford onto this. It seems that Ford uses the same distributor on a lot of engines at the time. It seems that pretty much everything that had points and was a V8 used the same thing. Got me thinking. I have a project back home that has a Ford V8 and I need to do ignition work on it soon. And on that, I was considering converting it to electronic ignition. So, I bought the parts for that project, right here, and I'm going to install it in this one. And then once I get this thing moved, I'm stealing the parts back and taking them with me. This is one of those Petronics points replacement systems where they basically take out your points and replace it with a magnetic pickup sensor. There's a hundred bucks, so it's a lot more expensive than points, but they don't really care about the gap. They don't care about your distributor shaft wobbling all over the place. This might be our solution. If it's not, it'll be the solution to my other project that I have to do the same thing on. This is a sign of how universal these Ford ignitions are. This Pertronics 1281 is for a Ford eight cylinder. No years, no models, just eight cylinder Fords. Might fit all of them, who knows? So now we put the pickup unit in place of the points. Then this little wheel goes on the distributor shaft. There's actually an octagon in there and that fits right on the lobes that used to have the points right on them. So we just drop that in. There's a little bit of a gap there. They say that you can run between 10 and 40 thou. So that shaft wobbling a bit won't be a big deal. That was a nice sound. I mean, it sounded like garbage, but it ran. And that's the big thing. Need to get some coolant for that thing. Hope a little bit of plant life doesn't hurt. We'll call that stop leak. Now that we have coolant, let's see if we can get it running a little longer. <laughs> Idles. Hear weird sounds though. <laughs> well now I need to get fuel into that carburetor. And I think through the lines would be the easiest bet. I bought some fuel rated clear line so I could see the fuel go through it. I popped the 14 bucks for the JDM speed motor fuel pump. So uh, I'm sure this is a quality unit at that price. My fuel system is basically perfect now. So I'm going to hook up power to that pump and see what happens. You're gurgling. That sounds like something's overflowing. Yeah, I think we have fuel pouring straight in. Got fuel dripping out the side. Looks like this float is stuck and it's overflowing right there. This is the standard first line repair technique. Because sometimes they're just stuck and they'll pop loose. I'm going to work on this wobbly radiator because it's run into the fan a few times now. Radiator's fixed. I'm going to leave the fuel pump off, start it up, and see where we're at. I smell rubber burning, which indicates the belts are slipping, like the one that drives the air compressor. So that's not necessarily a good thing. Figured I'd look over a few things. It doesn't appear the alternator turns. I'm going to crank the engine over. You guys keep an eye on that and tell me what happens. Oh, there we go. All right, we're turning. I'll just spray some oil in there and that should be fine. A little more freeing up may be necessary. Getting better. All fixed. Perfect. Let's see if the carburetor fixed itself. No. No, it did not. 
I just gotta yank the carburetor out of here and deal with it. Now this throttle linkage is pretty impressive. I gotta disconnect it in order to get this carburetor off. There we go. Now that we have the carburetor off, we can see how nice of an adapter plate it has. It's all just welded together with uh, plenty of nuts to hold it on. Impressive. Let's find out how long this day is going to be. Not that bad. I was expecting worse. That's on there. I do have all the bolts out. There we go. This one has a brass float. So two different floats in the same carburetor. While I'm at it, I'm gonna pop out these jets and just see how clogged they are. I like the way debris falls off them as they turn. These are fine, you can see right through them. This carburetor is virtually clean already. Just gotta scrape a few layers of dirt out of it. Now one good thing about an electric fuel pump is you don't have to have the carburetor installed on the vehicle to see if it's holding fuel. Oh, leaking like a sieve. I found a single feed line instead of the double feed line I have. I'm not planning on really using those secondaries. I only want the primaries. There's no point in fixing that float bowl. I just want that one. So we're only going to feed one side of the carburetor and just run off that. Now let's see if we can get just that side going. All right, it still leaks like a sieve. But at least we have half the leaking we did before, because that side's not leaking since it's not getting fuel. It's time to get a little more systematic in our approach. We're going to start with the bowl and go from the beginning. So we have fuel that goes in here. You can see in the casting it comes up through to here, and this is where the needle and seat go. And the float sits right below that and hits the bottom. So this needle and seat takes fuel from this top side and it's got a little pin that blocks off the fuel on the bottom. There's always fuel on the top and then it lets out fuel into the bottom when this float says that the level's getting low and it needs some more. Now this is going to screw right in here and that's going to stick through and hit this float. We try to power the fuel pump. The fuel pump is running and we have a closed system. There is no fuel leaking. Now I'll take out the screwdriver bit and I will lower it as though it needs fuel. Oop. Then we can see it runs pouring right in. So we have the first part working. So now we have to seal around the edges. And I see old chunks of gasket. I'm gonna scrape all that off. Got the bowl on with a new gasket. So now hit the pump, see if that fills up, lifts that float up, shuts off and holds the fuel inside. And no, fuel is pouring out everywhere, still. Now seeing this is still leaking, I've got a couple possibilities. We got the float, could be not floating. It feels light, it's not full of fuel for sure. I think that float is actually working. Which leads me to something in this carburetor body. There are valves, there's a possibility that sometime in the last 20 years, this got water in it, froze and cracked. So I'm not sure what the problem is, but I have a bigger one. I'm out of time. I'm far away from home and I gotta go back soon. So this is my last day to work on this thing. If I don't get it going today, it's not going this year. So I took a shortcut. I bought a cheap four barrel on Marketplace. Supposedly it came off a running car. He assured me it needed a rebuild because that car ran badly, but it was cheap and I have it in my hand. And hopefully it'll bolt on and get that thing running without fuel spraying everywhere. That homemade adapter looks fine for pretty much any four barrel. So I'll just knock some of the dirt off. There's already a gasket on it. We'll reuse that. And even though this is a completely different make four barrel, looks like he's gonna fit. And quite honestly, I really don't care how well it runs. I just want it to run for a little bit. Bolts right on, so that's good. I covered up all the excess vacuum ports with electrical tape, so we're fine with that. Hopefully this one doesn't leak. Looks like we got pressure. I don't see any fuel spewing out at all. So I'm gonna turn off the pump because we should have a full bowl of fuel there. Let's see if it starts and runs on the fuel it has.
looks like we got a runner. Wonder if it built any air pressure. Brakes are going to be another issue. Let's go look. We got nothing on the gauge. So that's not necessarily a good thing. So now I wired both the pump and ignition to the ignition switch. We got a full system here. Even though I initially filled the cooling system with pond water, I bought the cheap Walmart antifreeze to add to it. Because after I put this much work into it, I want this engine to be fully protected from freezing. You can't beat the combination of pond water and Walmart for success. So far, so good. Now we got to build air pressure. Do we have any air pressure? Air is reading. I said to check the reading before because it's above zero, but not by a whole lot. That one's reading nothing. Let's press the duct tape on the pedal and see what happens. Well, the valve moves. I don't hear anything happening though. Oil pressure looks real good. That's something. That looks like coolant. I'm hoping that leak is just a valve on the side of the block to drain it. So I shut it down so I can check that out. Oh. Okay, it's completely missing a plug. I wonder if there's one on the other side that's missing too. This one has a valve, so hopefully that'll just close. Got an old rusty pipe plug. Wire brush the threads a little bit so it should work fine. And I'm pretty sure rust is an effective thread sealant, so we should have no problems with this. I've got less coolant leaking out of the engine. I also turn up the idle a bit, because I have no throttle pedal. So we should be having a high idle now. We're in real good shape here. Better hooked up the choke. Might be running a little rig. Oh well. I'm hearing air leaking somewhere in this area. I think one of the airlines is leaking right there, and that's why I don't have uh, brake release. I want a truth here. Will it move? Got it in the gear. gas pedal. If I could rev it up, I might be able to get this to move. Okay, and we're boiling over after running for like a minute or two. That's not a good sign. I'm just going to let this cool down for a little bit. I can't move the gas pedal at all, so even if I hook it up, it doesn't matter. I rigged up the throttle back here, so I want to play with the throttle a little bit. But the fan blade is between me and the carburetor, so we made an extension. <laughs>
everything was going fine, I just shut it down on my own for two reasons. One is I saw that overheating happening earlier. I don't want to overheat that motor now that things are going well. And it seems like it'll start right back up. So hopefully, now that I'm completely blocking a trail, it will start right back up. The other thing is this front bumper. And right now, at the angle it's at, looks like my best shot to take it off. So while the engine cools down, I'm going to yank this front bumper, and that way I can bring that one back home. I wonder what this thing was for. Depth gauge, maybe? I just realized something cool while I was working on this bumper. Check this out. That's the shifter. The shifter actually twists and pulls and pushes that drive shaft with U-joints all the way to the transmission way in the back. And that's how you change gears. Now that's really cool. Hey, that was fast. Alrighty. We got a bumper. So now, all I have to do is get that bus a few hundred feet down that trail to its new parking spot. How hard can it be? At this point, everything was going really well, and I was cruising right along, until I got to the new parking spot, which I had just graded, and was soft. It took a while, but eventually I made it. That's it. And then it was done. Now this thing's not moving anytime soon. It's going to be used for parts. So I'm taking my new stuff and using that on another project. Taking this carburetor too. Need my tie down back. Important stuff. We're just gonna leave this old carburetor right here. Makes a good paperweight or sheet metal weight. That'll keep the stuff out of the intake. Well, that's it for this project. Quite honestly, it was the least fun project I've done in a long time. There's a lot of things that I expected to work and just didn't. But the good thing is, that means my next project is gonna be extra fun because I'm gonna have this one to compare it to. So, it's only uphill from here. Also, that's it for this year's mini-series of Grandpa's Backyard Special Editions. Now I've shown you guys a lot of the stuff that did happen here, but I haven't shown you even more. Some just didn't really relate. Some stuff just didn't make any sense. 
Some was just a drag. At least cover it up. Some things turned out to be unnecessary. Some I just didn't want to deal with. Some just didn't start right. Now those I got going, but need a bit more before I finish it. But I gotta go home. Taking the scenic way back. Hope you guys are having fun too, and we'll see you next time. What is that?